going to expand our weekly video segment to take you into the back shelves of your local video store, back where it says horror videos, and where kids are devouring some awful films that we call the video nasties. Are you freebasing inquiring minds want to know? I have to break free from this culture of mechanical reproductions and the thick incrustations dying on the surface. What the prime time gets. Pain, I can assure you, will be exquisite. As for our deaths, come with me and be immortal. We have such sights to show you. We've got to return some video. Hello, horror hounds, and welcome to the It Slays podcast. I'm your humble host, Rowan. And I'm Craft Store Monk's Hood Mike. And I'm Colton. It's Werewolf Jill. And we're back for another spooky episode of the Slays Podcast. But before we get into anything, you know where we're going to start. What have we been consuming? What have you been watching? What have you been reading? What have you been playing? What have you been listening to? I don't know. What have you been doing in general? And we'll start with the always has something on the list, Jill. Oh my god. I was really hoping you were going to pick me first again, but you the know what? You always pick panic me first. Scramble. Um, yeah, I don't like really know what I'm doing half the time. Right now I'm playing a really cool Switch game called <laughs> Lemon Cake, and it's a, it's a nice really cozy game where you um you own a bakery uh, and this ghost tells you what to do. Um and it's really cute. So yeah, doing that. I've been rewatching a lot of older movies. By older, I mean like early 2000s stuff. Last night I watched, um, after Ginger Snaps, Resident Evil and Underworld. So that was nice. a uh, blast from the past. Like the original Resident Evil movie or a different yeah. one? Or... Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, that's uh, all I got. So uh, what about you, Colton? I know you've got lots to say. Uh, I-, I would have lots to say if I actually wanted to talk about everything I've watched, but the main thing that I just realized we still haven't really discussed on the show is basically The Last of Us. So, you know, obviously it feels like ages ago now, but The Last of Us wrapped up its first season. And I have to say that as a huge fan of the games that overall I thought it was pretty great. Uh, but considering the game is one of my favorite video games of all time, I don't think the show really surpasses it in almost any regard. <laughs> like, that's not really a slam on the show. It's just kind of my opinion on how special that game is. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like, I love the incorporation of the game's soundtrack and the original score uh, throughout the series. I think Pedro Pascal's performance as Joel, uh, it's a little different than the game counterpart, but it, it's still rock solid for what he has to do on the show. I think Bella Ramsey's uh, performance as Ellie is even better than Joel's. I thought she was the stand uh, standout of the show for me. And uh, I love how a lot of the game's dialogue is literally transplanted like word for word uh, into the television show. That being said, I do have some issues with the amount of screen time devoted to minor characters or ones that were not even present at all in the game. Uh, specifically, a lot of action scenes were cut here. And uh, I get you don't want to turn this into like The Walking Dead, like kind of forcing an action scene every single episode. But a lot of, I don't know if I want to call them like iconic, but certainly moments that I remember throughout the games were just not here. And then the action scenes that were here for the first half of the season were like relatively bloodless or kind of toned down almost that it seemed like they were framing uh the the you know quote unquote heroes of the show almost i don't know like kind of too lightly like just kind of not really focusing on like the acts they were committing which then in the latter half of the season where they do start showing the violence and it gets a little bit more gory it just felt a little tonally inconsistent and caused a little bit of issues with some of the characters like i was having to explain to people that haven't played the games like oh but you do realize joel is a bad guy and they're like yeah but i i loved him for the last eight episodes so it's just almost like a failure on the show to a degree if they don't get across to general audiences that yo joel's a bad guy <laughs> you know so yeah that's a, that seems like a glaring issue but i'd say like my main gripe with the show is that i just can't shake the fact that in retrospect the whole thing just feels a little rushed like i feel like if it was a 10 episode order by hbo it'd be even stronger And at 12 episode order, I feel like it may have even been on par with the video game. But what we have here is just a little bit less than. Regardless, I I still think what Craig Mazin and Neil Druckmann did is uh, remarkable. I do believe that they created probably the best video game adaptation we've seen so far. And I can't wait to see how they adapt The Last of Us Part 2 just because I really enjoyed that game as well. But I think there's more ways you can improve upon it uh, in adapting the material to a television series, whereas the first one just 
seemed kind of straightforward to me. And then when they changed things, it was kind of like annoying, almost like, well, why'd you change it? It was better in the original, you know, source material. So yeah, I mean, that's kind of rambly, but you know, I really love the source material. And uh, I still think it was a great adaptation, but it just kind of left me wanting a little more. Did you finish the series afterwards, Jill? I know you were watching yeah. it. Like, what do you think of it overall? Um, I didn't play the games, um, so okay. I really liked it. I did, however, after finishing it, uh, watch my friend uh, start to play, is it Last of Us 2? Yeah, part two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that was really cool. And um, so, yeah, I was watching that. But I really yeah, like the show. I really like the characters. And I agree. I, mm. I did like uh, Joel's character. So, like you said, that would they do try to you know give him sort of like anti hero qualities, mm -hmm. but he's just too good. Like you just love him no matter what. So yeah, it's kind of like in a <laughs> game where you where you play as the character and you're literally like, "Yo, I killed three hundred people." By the time I get to this point in the game, whereas in in the show, it's like, "I killed five people," and we cut away so you didn't see the headshots. And if you did see the shot, there's no blood. So let's kind of you know skim yeah. past this really quick until like the last two or three episodes where you know. They have to really kind of show violence, you know, to make it hit. I heard uh, people actually complaining about the lack of um, infected in the show. What do yeah. you think about that? Yeah, I mean, there there's not enough infected for sure, but it's also like the couple of action sequences or parts that they cut would have definitely showed them a little bit more. Like specifically, like I'm kind of talking around it, but there's a sequence in the game where Joel kind of steps on a, a booby trap and he gets strung upside down. And, like, it's just iconic. It's, like, from the games, it's one of the first things they showed. And also when I was playing it, I just, you know, you're hanging upside down fighting for your life. And I just yeah. couldn't wait to see it to be adapted to the screen. And it just wasn't adapted uh -huh. in any way. So yeah. there was, like, there were small things where that was one in particular, though, where it should have been in probably episode two or three the entire series. I was just waiting for it. I was like, when's this going to resurface? When are they going to repurpose it in episode six or seven or whatever? And it just never came. So... There should yeah. be more infected. I mean, I, I'm not like a Walking Dead person. I don't care too much. For me, the core story of The Last of Us is still just a Joel and Ellie story, but it's just, yeah. you know, I, I would have did some things slightly differently, I guess. Yeah. I, I, uh, even still, I thought, um, you know, they're focusing on the other elements of, you know, what's more scary? Is it humanity or is it the infected? So I feel like they're really focusing on the humanity aspect. Yeah, which which once again, like that, that's a perfectly like fine thing to focus on. I mean, the game does it as well. But I also feel like uh, that's like once again, it's maybe it's just since it came out after The Walking Dead did 10 seasons about that. It winds up being like, <laughs> mm -hmm. we are The Walking Dead, which was in season one. So it's not really like breaking new ground or anything by yeah. saying like, look how t terrible humanity is. Right. That's true. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Like The Last of Us to me is stronger in showing the horrific aspects of humanity, all this violence, all this gore that you'd have to do to survive. But then also contrasting it against how wholesome and loving the relationship between Joel and Ellie is in the first game. So it uh -huh. was kind of when you lesser the violence or lesser the action, you know, and you take it down a notch to me, like the more emotional or loving moments don't have, they don't shine quite as strongly to me, I guess is kind of, yeah. you know, it's, st it's still great. And that's the thing. I still really enjoy the show. It's just when you love something so much, you want to see it adapted to the absolute best case. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, I mean, the only other thing I watched, I've, you know, we've kind of went back and forth. That's probably even worth mentioning is John wick chapter four, which, uh, I, I have any of you guys seen John Wick? Do you care about those movies? Like I've seen. No. Uh, I haven't seen the third one. Okay, yeah, yeah, I've seen, seen one, one and yeah. two. I haven't seen the third. Yeah. So in my opinion, like the third one kind of winds up going a little bit too sprawling. Like it develops uh, the world, like you know that whole like world of assassination and hotel stuff a little bit too much. Where it kind of it almost like eats itself. It gets a little bit like too silly and grandiose. This one, <laughs> it's a John Wick movie, but it's almost three hours long. And I am not joking when I would say probably two hours of it is literally just nonstop action. Like, it's it's absolutely insane. Like, within the thir first 30 minutes, you have, like, probably about a 25-minute action set piece where there's, like, katanas and nunchucks and arrows and machine guns <laughs> and shotguns and a blind oh. assassin, you know, with all motion trackers and shit. It's absolute nonsense. And... The last probably hour and 10 minutes of the movie is just like a big action set piece that feels like the end of the movie. And then it's like, oh, there's another one. And then it's like, oh, no, it's not over. There's another one. And it just keeps going. There's like four or five of them stacked back to back. So like if you like, you know, this John Wick style, this gun fu style, if you like Keanu Reeves, you know, saying 20 lines of dialogue for a whole movie, most of them are. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> you'll you'll probably like, you know, John Wick Chapter 4. I thought it was probably my second favorite. My The, the second one, I think, was 
uh, my favorite overall, just because I thought it balanced kind of expanding that world of assassination and uh, still having a little bit for John Wick as a character to do. Like, it balanced it better. Oh, my God. Just almost choked on air. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed it. It was fun. My my audience was, like, screaming and hollering at the, the, the screen the entire time. There's so much silly shit in the movie wow. that was just so fun to watch. But, yeah, I mean... That's basically all I really care to watch or talk about watching. Uh, what about you, Rowan? What have you been watching? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I was kind of sad. You you left out the most important thing, which was I Winnie. always have Winnie. The, I always plug our now <laughs> slang. You can do it for once, Rowan. Come on. So uh, me and Colton watched uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey yeah. for our latest episode of Now Slain. So, Oof. you know, here are th- thoughts. Go, go listen. I feel like people will be surprised what our thoughts were on it so it was a fun discussion is what i'll say yeah you know our discussion was a lot more fun than the movie itself you know and and yes you may be surprised and uh you know i also got to earlier this week spend some time with jill and watched uh chupa on tubi (laughs) which is going to be the upcoming stream screams episode and that was that was just something to behold uh it was dog shit is what it was (laughs) Um, I, I saw you give it five stars on Letterbox, Rowan. <laughs> yeah, it, it was uh, <laughs> it was a pure masterpiece. I thought uh, I learned about a whole new uh, subgenre of horror that's called. Um, it's not direct to video; it's direct on video, and it's basically like '90s, early 2000s, just like movies you'd shoot with like hundred dollar home video cameras. They apparently it's a whole subgenre. So this was my first experience with it. It's lower quality than found footage. I will say that. I thought you were going to say there's no editing. Like literally like a home <laughs> I video. Mean, you just I record mean, it really. for 90 minutes. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> not really. So maybe. Uh, and then a couple other things that I checked out. Uh, I did finally get to see Creed 3 in the theater. And I enjoyed that. I, I don't think. Why I, didn't they call it Threed? <laughs> they should have <laughs> i know me and colton offline had kind of talked about it about whether or not the like anime influence worked it worked for me i like i thought this was the second best i i think the first is still the best one but i thought this was far better than the second one uh so i really enjoyed that um uh, i also finally got a chance to check out the whale because i've been waiting to see it for a while and, uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty horse shit. So <laughs> I, I, I was glad I found my community that also felt it was horse shit. So no comment. <laughs> I'm just saying, man, it was bad. It was bad. It was sad. I, I did, you know, I, I feel like I could appreciate the, the Brendan Fraser ness of it. Although I've never been a huge Brendan Fraser fan, but it was kind of sad that like the minute the movie started, I knew so you're it, dead inside. Yeah, well, I just I knew the beats. I knew exactly what was gonna happen, like when it was gonna happen. It was just kind of a to me like a paint by numbers kind of Oscar drama, and they really there wasn't anything that surprising in it. And then yeah, really the only other thing I'll mention, or the other two things I'll mention is. I finally uh, finished up uh, Colton's Baby Babylon, and I I thought it was just coming back to back with just shitting on movies I enjoy. I like I mean I like Babylon. I I thought it was good. I gave it a three out of five. I thought that was a good rating. I I said like on my Letterbox review, and I definitely messaged Colton immediately after like the whole Tobey Maguire stuff in it. Is like my favorite. I was like, that's some of my favorite stuff on film for 2022. Cause it just like for 10 minutes devolves into like this weird horror movie type thing going on. And I just really liked it. It was creepy and Tobey Maguire was awesome. And then last, I'll just say, uh, I did get a chance to check out uh, somebody I used to know, which was Dave Franco sophomore project that went on Amazon and I thought it was pretty good. I liked it. Uh, I didn't like it as much as I liked the rental. I mean, obviously, this isn't a horror. This was like a romantic comedy. Uh, I don't think it was fully successful in either one of those things. But if you're into that mumblecore genre of film, this kind of works. The music was good. Alison Bree is charming as ever. And yeah, that's all I'll 
I've really been watching or doing in general. Uh, I, I won't talk about Corey Feldman's book. Don't worry, guys. Uh, I'll save that for another day. Uh, Mike, what have you been consuming? Wait, I forget the title of his book. Is it Choreography? Yeah, yeah it's like Choreography, okay. I think. Oh, come on. Like, <laughs> I was like, I just, I I appreciate a good, like, punny title. Anyway, um, <laughs> now I really want to read it. Uh, what have I been consuming? Well, um, like colton said i finished the last of us and really enjoyed it also shout out to ashley johnson being in the last episode that was really cool i love her um and i also finally started watching and finished the first season of yellow jackets which i adored and i just started watching Right before we started recording, I just started watching the new episode that just came out on Friday. So, so Mike, did the latter half of the first season, like, uh, was it still really good for you? Because I've I've heard some people say, like, it falls apart in the latter half of the season one. I've only seen the first three episodes, so I've never watched past that. It's just, was it consistent for you the whole way through, like, enjoyable? or? I think so, yeah. Yeah? Okay. I mean, no. I, I think people are have, like, an idea set in their head of what's going to happen and it might not be doing that and that might oh, cause okay. some people to sort of like you know though. yeah 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 that's i think that's what it is because i also had expectations so i feel like yeah if if people have an idea set in their head it's definitely gonna uh sway them one way or the other but i'm really enjoying it i couldn't i like literally can't wait to finish this episode awesome the new one yeah and other than that uh i spent the entire weekend like a lot of other people playing the amazing resident evil 4 remake on my playstation how many hours you got in that now because i think i'm at like i think i'm right around 15 or 16 hours in since friday i hang on now i i know that i'm I'm not as far, I don't think, as I should be with how many hours I have. Mm -hmm. uh, like, Friday, I literally almost did nothing all day. I did take a break from it, but, like, 90% of my day was spent with that. Let me see. Yeah, you basically no life it on the <laughs> first day. I played, like, seven hours, I want to say, that day, which is still, uh, you know, basically a working day. So I probably have about as many hours. I probably have a few more hours than you. I I planned on literally getting up at, like nine and streaming it all day friday and then doing the same thing saturday until i had to go out saturday night but mm. then my playstation in the mid like five hours into my stream or six hours like kept like the game kept going black and my playstation would like disconnect from my tv like a thing would pop up on the tv mm. like roku saying like ps5 <laughs> not found okay when i would go to certain areas on the map like, it didn't happen. Like, I would click the button to leave the game, and it would pop back up on my screen. And I reinstalled it and literally went to the same part on the map, and my screen would go black. Like, it was the weirdest thing. Earth. That's so weird. I have no idea. Yeah, so I got frustrated and stopped playing it for a couple hours. But that's the only reason that I stopped. Are you a fan of the original Resident Evil 4? I, like... I played it so many times, okay. I can't even. Right. Like, yeah. literally, I own it for every... every gaming thing I've ever had. Like, PC, Wii, Wii U ps3 ps4 ps5 like yeah switch anything you could get it on i bought it <laughs> multiple times so yeah awesome i had really high high expectations and they have been met so far yeah that's what i feel as well it's been great so far i've been mm -hmm. thoroughly enjoying it other than they've changed the merchant's voice slightly yes and they've also I given was, them... i was waiting for him to go what are you buying <laughs> what <laughs> and are I'm you like, selling he didn't... what yeah, yeah. Right. He... yeah. Neither of that is in there so far. No. And they, they've given him like 10 times the amount of lines at least. I almost feel like he's too chatty in a way. Like he's a little annoying, um, the merchant in this one, just too much so. I know. I ran in while I was being like shot at with arrows. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go in there because they won't follow me in here. And he's like, oh, I guess my break is over. And I'm like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, fucking asshole i'm getting shot at here and you're making also, a saucy comment also i think leon looks a little bit too much like his resident evil 6 version where he's like a grown-ass man and he's not mm. like this sniveling little emo kid anymore which i prefer the little like emo kid you know leon he looks just a little bit too strong in a way when yeah I he's supposed yeah. to be like in between because it's exactly after yeah. you know his like rookie day but also like 
he's still a kid, right? Yeah, so I was like, ah, you're a little bit too old. He, you know, in the original, I don't know if he looks like he's 40, you know, type of thing. No, but, definitely not. But other than that, I mean, it, it's been great. Those are minor gripes, you know? Yeah, I, I was not sure. I, I got... My favorite, like, video game character, I think, of all time is Ada Wong. So when she popped up and she was wearing, she wasn't wearing her, like, iconic Mm -hmm. uh, dress, I was, like, shocked and offended for, like, 30 seconds. And then I was like, oh, she's still serving, though, so I don't care. (laughs) Her her voice acting, though, is... uh... I don't know. This is once again. I rough. loved it. You I love it in it. this? Okay. Yeah. All right. We're on, we're on opposite yeah. sides, but you know, I'm glad you <laughs> it's want fine. It. Yeah. 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 So that's pretty much it for me, honestly. That's that's all I've been doing. I'm about to start a new book called The Setting Sun by Osamu Desai, so I can't wait to read that. There we go. That's it. Me in a nutshell. <laughs> well, let's get into the episode. So this was Jill's pick. Do you want to uh, introduce the film, Jill? All right. So my pick was Ginger Snaps, which is... Probably my favorite horror movie of all time. I think it's a Canadian masterpiece. Uh, My entire personality in high school was based on this movie. I watched it all the time. I had it on DVD. Uh, The DVD has like the option to watch that slideshow that's in the opening, like as much as you want. And then I played that (laughs) sick, sick soundtrack on the uh, extra features as well all the time. I love this movie. It is like my baby, so I'm going to be very protective, and I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, uh, but I think I think it's just great, um, and I think it's timeless. Like uh, It's one of those movies that stands the test of time, and uh, going back, and even though it's from like 2000, it still hits the same way as it did when I was a little edgy adolescent. Well, with that, we'll uh, get to the trailer, and then we'll be back with the synopsis. <laughs> Out by 16 or dead in the scene, but together forever. They're just being normal teenage girls. I'm not dying in this room with you! I'm not dying! Daniel! You know, we're almost not even related anymore. Ginger Snaps was directed by John Fawcett and written by Karen Walton, and the story is as follows. Death-obsessed sisters and teenage outcasts Bridget and Ginger must deal with the consequences when one of them is bitten by a werewolf. So first experiences, is this our first time watching it? Is this something we've owned on every form of media? We watched it whenever it was on television, we love it. Or is it something that we don't really revisit Because we have bad opinions on horror and we hate women. Colton, is this your first time watching it? What the fuck is that transition, (laughs) (laughs) Rowan? Oh, God. Um... No, He's it's not my up first assassination. <laughs> yeah, it's not my first time watching it, but this is one that I did not watch probably in the period of life when I should have watched it. I, I kind of learned about Ginger Snaps only in like 2014, 2015. And it was when I was in a screenwriting group and uh, one of the women in the group was writing uh, kind of like a teenage werewolf thing that also happened to line up with, uh, God, like uh, puberty and whatnot, like adolescence, you know, like getting your period and whatnot. And then someone was like, oh, this is just like Ginger Snaps. And I was like, oh, I've heard of that. But like, I never knew what it was in my head. So the first time I watched it was only like two or three years ago. So like I watched it for the first time when I was like a, probably like a 27 year old man who did have a pretty, you know, <laughs> long emo phase as a lot of us did. You know, I feel like I was probably an emo kid from 2005 to 2009, at least. So, I thought you were going to say 2023. I mean, in musical taste, 100%. <laughs> uh, definitely still an emo kid. But, uh, yeah, I just watched it very much, you know, outside of those ages. But, yeah, this is probably my second time checking it out. Uh, what about you, Mike? I watched it when it came out. I don't think it came out in theaters here, but I feel like... I bought the DVD, like, at Walmart or something, like, literally the day it came out. Because I was like, oh my god, like, I've heard about this movie, I really want to see it. And I remember instantly falling in love with it. And, like Jill, kind of, like, making it a little bit of my personality personality. for a while. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And just, like, I was, like, that kid running around, like, going, oh my god, you have to see Ginger Snaps. You haven't seen Ginger Snaps? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Listen, it's hard when you live in the Bay. Do you want to know how I got Ginger Snaps? Where uh, we don't have a Walmart. 
I need in to northern know. Newfoundland. Uh, my friend Ryan, he had a sister who lived in Ontario, and I was like, man, if you could get Ginger Snaps, that would be so cool. Oh. So he got a copy of Ginger Snaps. I ripped it off onto a DVD, and uh, I got all three of them, too. And, uh, yeah, that was, like, gold because, uh, yeah, that's hard to get good physical media up there. Yeah, especially back in the day. Yeah. But, yeah, so I've watched it, like, a bunch of times since then. It's, you know, it's a it's a don't know what you're going to watch sitting around drinking. And, again, then going, oh, my God, you haven't seen Ginger Snaps? I must show it to you. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, having, still having that old DVD in a CD wallet somewhere. So it's classic. I'll never throw it out. What about you, Ro? Uh, so, yeah, I've seen this a bunch of times the first time i ever saw this was actually on television uh this used to play on the space channel all the time like at one o'clock in the morning so i had seen it like in bits and parts uh i'd seen it in full eventually and uh then it was something i just kind of seeked out at blockbuster and stuff and Rented it often, uh, I had bought it, I did promise last episode I'd tell my story, so, the Exilia in, uh, Ginger Snap story, which is kind of amusing, is that, uh, I found out Scream Factory put a collector's edition of this out, so I was like, I needed a birthday present for Exilia, and I really remembered, like, at least five to ten conversations me and Exilia had about her seeing this movie when she was younger and really enjoying this movie and liking it, but like never seeing it anywhere or anything. I said, Oh, you know what? That's a perfect gift. Cause they, they have it out on this like collector's edition now. So I bought it for her, wrapped it up, gave it to her. She opened it. No idea what it was. And I've never seen a more disappointed face in a present in my life. I was like, yeah, remember we had all these conversations about it. Apparently, I just made up all those conversations. She's like, I've never, <laughs> I've never even heard of this movie or seen this movie. Why would you buy me this? <laughs> anyway, the good thing is that we watched it together and Exilia loved it. And, uh, you know, this, I think this is up here for one of her, one of her fave horror movies. Hell yes. Oh, good. That saved Love you from divorce. <laughs> so I didn't know that it, was there was there anything else, Jill, that you wanted to talk about with your first experiences, or are you good to just get into her? Um, no, pretty much the same as you. It was always on the Space Channel, and that's where I saw it originally. It was on TV, and I was like, I need to have this. Uh, Shout but out yeah. to the Space Channel. Shout out. Let's get into it. So we know where we're starting first. And meat and potatoes, everything. Our favorite scene and or favorite kill. Mike, we'll let you start. Um, okay, so I think it's gonna be a, like, favorite kill. I don't want to step on anyone's toes, so I'm just gonna do my favorite kill, which is not even really a kill, I guess, in a way. It's just more of a death, and that's... It's the milk. When it's the milk, it's Trina. <laughs> so first of all, I... One of my favorite, you know, movie tropes in horror is, like, the, you know, bitchy character, the antagonist. I all I like I love a good bitch. <laughs> I always have. <laughs> um and the moment that it showed her the first time I watched it, I was like, oh my god, that fucking like sneer on her face, I'm gonna become obsessed with this woman. <laughs> and I just I wanna did. smack her and be her. I was like, at the yeah, I was time. like, I need to be her friend. Um <laughs> Yeah, I just really like that scene. I I enjoyed that they didn't do the and I do, okay, I'm not saying I have a problem with this trope, but they didn't do the usual trope of like setting up this like bitchy character who all of a sudden you know is going to become their like greatest ally like she was their enemy right to the very end and i kind of like that they they went there um mm -hmm. and then of course you know she slips and falls like completely by accident but you know she kind of has it coming obviously because she's a piece of shit but also <laughs> you feel for her because you know she also got a lot of shit that she didn't deserve like her dog being i guess eaten or i don't know yeah whatever it was ginger did but I just really enjoyed that scene. I I thought it was cool to show her having her, like, vulnerable moment, you know, where she, like, oh, she really cares about, you know, what's his face? Jason, is it? I don't Sam? Remember. No, Sam. Why did I call him Jason? Is that his name in real life? I don't know. There's anyway. a there's a Jason. There is also. a Jason in the movie as well. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm just, yeah. it's men's names. They all sound the same to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I just I really enjoyed that whole scene and I loved that her kill involved milk and was accidental. 
Um, yeah, so that's it. What about you, Colton? Yeah, you stole mine. So uh, oh, I'm, I'm probably going to go. I tried to... not to step on anyone's toes. <laughs> yeah, I, ha- I had this whole thing talking about how it does triple duty, you know, creating three different things, you know, and all these payoffs. But yeah, you stole it. So uh, I'll go with the car scene, I guess, where uh, Ginger, uh, you, there's some rapey vibes with Sam. And uh, yeah, there's the one really cool shot of like showing that her spine kind of pushing out through her skin. I thought that was a pretty neat shot. Right, so, yeah, that would probably be my backup, I would say. Uh, what about you, Rowan? Uh, so you, you guys didn't take mine. Mine's actually the janitor kill. I really love, like, the lighting when they're in school. And we get that, I always call it the Canadian Are You Afraid of the Dark camera angle where we just tilt the camera a little bit. So it's, oh, like, kind of... Yeah. yeah. And but it's just so it's so like kids horror Canadian television, and I I just loved everything about that scene. Like I said, the lighting's really great. I think you know Ginger looks awesome in that scene, like with the makeup going, and and that's kind of where she's getting into this transformation a little more heavily. And it's just like it's brutal. It's, it's kind of action packed. I just really, really like that scene. Uh, what about you, Jill? Oh my god! First, I have so much to say. First of <laughs> all, that janitor scene gets me so hard in the feels. Like I really feel for that guy. He was such a nice guy. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, there's so much to unpack there. But anyway, I did for favorite death enjoy the milk scene. It's so iconic. It's gorgeous. It's really cool how they played it off at the end. Uh, I just love the aesthetic of the milk and the blood mixing together. Uh, But my favorite scene is actually the very last shot when the credits are rolling. Um, It's just really beautiful to me um, because you have like the juxtaposition of, uh, I say that word like every episode. I'm so sorry. I'm a piece of shit. The juxtaposition of the two beds that the sisters shared, and it's kind of like symbolizing their childhood, how like codependent they are. Um, they do everything for each other. They live for each other. And, and they made this like pact to go out together. Um, you know, and Bridget takes really good care of her sister throughout the whole movie, but eventually, uh, you know, she decides to go her own way. So I think it's really cool that she's like situated in the middle of the shot between the beds, like holding ginger's dying body and uh you can tell she's gonna like go on her own way now but uh i don't know the symmetry of it is really nice and that is my favorite shot and then the music in the background oh my god it just gives me chills i'm <laughs> sorry so so i'm gonna come across as dumb now but is that supposed to be what the actual you know how ginger gets stabbed at the end because obviously there's the syringe and there's the knife i just like truly didn't understand exactly what happened there like I was like, oh, oh, she dies. Well, I know she gets stabbed by the knife. I mean, that's that's yeah. apparent. But why why wasn't the syringe used? I was like, oh, did Ginger choose to kill herself, stab herself with the knife instead of the syringe, or like what happened with the vaccine type of thing? Oh, I think it's because um, I mean, she's already... she has both of them, right? Like, there's the close yeah. up, like yeah, yeah. And then I was I like, oh, she gets late. lunged, she gets lunged at, and I don't know, she just stabbed. I, I, it was just literally like a logic issue to me that I was like, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Yeah. If it was like Ginger's choice to like leap on the knife or if Bridget just accidentally lashed out and stabbed or if it was literally like what you were saying choosing to go her own way like I just I uh wasn't a hundred well you know in the end she did like fight her sister and you know decided to like split from that because uh Ginger was being like you you know come on you can turn with me or whatever. Uh, but I'm not sure if that monk's hood is a whole cure. I well, think it's th- more something that staves it off. So I, I think it was too late for her at that point anyways. She just had to kill okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I assumed, and she had killed so many people and animals. Like, I just, I saw it as she was like, there's no point in giving her this. Like, she is fully transformed. She's She's gone now. She's no longer Ginger. Yeah, I guess I would have liked, uh, just for clarification's sake, if it was tried or if it was crushed or if there was some reason why it wasn't there. Because, like, literally the whole kind of part of that scene, like, going to the drug dealer, doing these all these subplots of setting up this monk's hood, what you're saying, is for the ultimate payoff of trying to use it on her sister and then... Once it's there, it just doesn't happen. So it was kind of like for me, I was just wondering. It's really in the, the second movie they use that monk's hood a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I but, bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> if you haven't seen Ginger Snaps 2. I haven't, leash. but you know. But anyway. It, 
it, it's just kind of like in this movie that you know that we spend a lot of time setting up this uh, monk's hood and a lot of time <laughs> with this drug dealer character whose purpose is to be the way of setting this stuff up we don't use it really other than that one guy jason you make know. me so angry sometimes I'm, I'm just saying like I, i'm just saying it was literally like an issue i like i, I know I'm what you're kidding. saying i know the framing i know, like i do believe it's a nice shot i completely agree it was just like for me there was confusion in the shot where it, w- it would work better if there was no confusion for me i guess i, I don't know I gotcha. that's all that's cool yeah just shit on my favorite scene <laughs> no it, it wasn't shitting on it. i was just literally asking a question i, I i'm you know, kidding i'm kidding yeah I'm kidding. just okay. yeah <laughs> I, it's I not, do it's understand. It's not like Rowan with the whale, you know. It's you know, I'm just asking a question. <laughs> I understand, Colton, because I was also a little confused at it. Okay, I kind of, I kind of took it that I was like, oh, maybe there's like a process of making that, like making this vaccine or whatever. So maybe it was just like the one dose, and then I had kind of thought, well. You know, she mixed her blood with gingers, so maybe she knows, like, I also need to cure myself. Yeah, I was like, I don't understand how there was confusion. Like, she could use it on one person. She, I guess, chose... She could have made more, though. The movie never showed her... Well, I guess it did show her a little bit, like, changing, right? Like she, Yeah, it did. uh, She was saying, like, I can't feel my hand. Yeah, I can't feel my hand. That was the one thing. But, yeah, when she's, like, lapping up the blood. Well, it's a thing. Yeah. (laughs) It's there. It is a thing. I mean, I was far checked out by the movie by that point, but you are right. It is a thing. Okay. Oh, (laughs) jeez. There will be blood. (laughs) That, that's a movie, mu- that's a much better movie. There Jesus. will be blood. Ass we, movie. <laughs> if we could do that on the show, jeez. I was gonna say there's a little bit of a, a special place, not just because I love this movie as a horror movie, but uh, a little East Coast connection. Uh, Kara Walton, who is the writer, is actually from Halifax here. Oh, so yeah. uh, another reason that I've. I've always, you know, kind of been into this movie. And then obviously, I was going to say, uh, you know, John Fawcett has been a pretty successful Canadian creator. You know, he did this, co-created uh, Orphan Black, and also directed a bunch of uh, Queers Folk also. You know, just uh, Canadian excellence here going on on the East Coast. Yeah. Also a woman. Which is, I think, kind of important because this is directed by a man, but they co-wrote this uh, together, uh, which I think is really smart for a movie kind of about menstruation. Yeah, well, and definitely, I mean, because we've, you know, we've reviewed quite a few films now that I think have uh, brushed that line of kind of like portraying themselves as these as these like feminist films and then they're you know, written, directed entirely by men, like women have no input on the creative process where I I think this movie does a good job at like, you can tell the authenticity of it. I think like the, I I personally think the story's told well enough and, and I guess what I would imagine would connect enough with like a female audience. Like, I don't know what it's like to go through female puberty, so I can't relate to it. But I was like, I feel like they do a pretty, pretty good job at this. Because, I mean, this isn't, like, a new topic, all you know, all the way back to Carrie and even older. Like, the, these are stories that are told, but often told through a, uh, a male lens. And it's usually, you know, which I think is still interesting with this film. But, you know, on, and on the male lens side, it's always told as, like this gruesome occurrence which it's still the monstrous is. feminine yeah yeah the monstrous feminine that's exactly uh thank you mike that's exactly what i was thinking of uh just eloquently put it for me but yeah and uh i was gonna say especially on that on that note i would uh i've only read bits and parts out of it chap uh like chapters i've kind of had to find on pdf because the the book is out of print but there's a really good book uh recreational terror which but uh yeah i i would highly suggest reading that they actually in um there's a great documentary on the screen factory blu-ray of this about uh female puberty represented in film throughout time and uh that was actually the first place i had ever heard of that book but uh this you know they they look at movies like this and uh, go into it. So I thought that'd be a good thing to plug. Yeah, I figured uh, that now is a better time than ever. That we got it, guys. We got to give Mike a little time to uh, 
to vent here, a little time to just fan fanboy over some of the some of the actresses in this. <laughs> Because you know we have we have the we have the mom the mom Mimi, iconic Mimi, Mimi Rogers Mimi, Mimi Rogers she's so great. My third note, all caps, four exclamation points. Mimi, <laughs> she's so kooky. I love her. But like I thought, like Mimi Rogers was awesome. Uh, Emily Perkins, who is like uh, queen, uh, a childhood favorite of mine. I, I've said many times it. that. It, the original yeah. miniseries, is like my all time one of my all time favorite horror things, and she played Beverly Marsh in that one the, as a child. And then, uh, yeah, Catherine Isabel, who Catherine also Isabel. as a teen, uh, you know, I remember going opening night to go see Freddy versus Jason, <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. she was so obnoxious in that movie. <laughs> yeah. She's naked, right? Yeah. <laughs> I I won't say I won't. You say don't remember here. as a teenager, Rowan? Come on. Listen, <laughs> I just go check out Freddy vs. Jason. It's, it's. I uh, mean, it does have that iconic Kelly Rowland line <laughs> about the Christmas sweater and a slur that we will not say, but oh it's very God. funny. <laughs> uh, but Catherine Isabel, I love her so much. She is so good. She. Like, I would want to say she carries the movie, but the movie is so good that it doesn't need to be carried. Uh, But she's like my bisexual awakening. When I saw that movie, I was like, she is so gorgeous. Do you know that she she Twitch streams now? Really? Yeah. Like, not all the time, but every now and then I'll get a ding on my phone and I'm like, oh, who's alive? And it's like, oh, it's Catherine Isabel playing uh, whatever, Roblox. or That's so random. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I thought she was. Good. It was actually kind of interesting because I haven't rewatched this in a long time. So when I first started watching this uh, for this episode, I had actually forgot what sister it was that turned into the werewolf. So I like I couldn't remember. Like it's it, called it's been, Ginger. It's snaps literally the twelve. Well, I, <laughs> I wasn't putting the two and two together when I was watching. No, it. you weren't putting I, nothing together. <laughs> although I might have been like mildly distracted by uh, Emily Perkins's wig. Like oh god, this oh my film. god, it's wig. It's so obvious. It's a wig. And yeah. Then when it, you watch the DVD and it has the like. Uh, screen tests or whatever that they did for it and it shows her with like her head shaved for whatever it was she was doing at the time and it's like whoa yeah that that, yeah. that makes the wig even more obvious <laughs> <laughs> all you can see is her with her shaved head I know they were talking about on the on the special features like John Foss was saying when they did the casting. She had normal hair, but then when they came in for the screen test, she had sh- she had shaved her whole head, and they were just like, <laughs> "Fuck!" <laughs> <laughs> so they were just like, "Yeah, I guess you're wearing a wig the whole time." <laughs> and- it kind of works though. It makes her look more like mousy and yeah, mousy. Frumpy. Well, this yeah, was yeah, kind of yeah. my thing. Like I was distract. I I felt I was distracted by it, but I was like, it's also kind of unsettling because it's like not great. So I was like, it, it is, I guess, working on that end of it that I just am creeped out by it. Well, it does make in her look next like movie, disheveled. It does. Yeah. It does. And in the next movie, she doesn't wear a wig, and in, and she looks way better. But I think she does need to be like I don't know. Uh, Catherine Isabel like needs to outshine her in the first movie as her sister who's like she you know. easily outshines her i mean emily perkins yeah. i think is bad in this movie for oh my god for about two-thirds of it she is better by the end of it when she can finally get rid of the really cringy i'm an emo girl thing that she's doing where i speak <laughs> monotone and have a blank face uh but it like by the third act when she can actually be a character she's good but for the rest of the movie, I, I have like numerous notes where I'm just like literally like I was an emo teenager and the way they are portraying this is like literally like a 40 year old wrote it. So it's like I, I well, assume Karen Walton was younger and probably actually <laughs> understood like what that was. But a lot of the dialogue in this, especially from that character, it just it made me cringe. And I don't know if it's her performance. I think I've only probably seen her in this, uh, but uh, I did not enjoy her <laughs> very much. I thought Ginger was easily better, um, even though she has a lot of really cringy lines as well. Yeah, but, but she's got uh, a lot of really good ones too. I like. Well, her she does have some good ones too. Lines, yeah, yeah, I do agree. Like, like I said, I do like her in the movie. She's she's probably my favorite part of the movie. Is just yeah, the, the sister was. Uh, I did not enjoy <laughs> her performance. 
That's fair. That's fair. I, I actually made note of, like, I thought there was quite a few lines that were, like, so bad they were good in it. Like, there was one where uh, it's Sam, yeah, Sam is the, the weed dealer, right? Yeah. 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 Botanist, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> But Sam has the thing where, like, uh, he just says biology, something you can s- sink your teeth into. Mm-hmm. And I was Rowan, just... you say that literally every week. I <laughs> And then meat and potatoes meat every and potatoes. single week. Yeah, well, I'm saying I appreciate it. I thought they were good. <laughs> I also really liked uh, when uh, Jason's, like, confronting Bridget, and then he uh, he says... What was his, his line was he's way out on the corner of fucked up and evil. I was just like, these are these. This is awesome. This is, Colton shakes his um, head, but I love yeah, every I, minute I, of it. Yeah. Like, what don't, don't get me wrong. Funny. Some some of the, some of them do work for me. Like, I, I do have notes like written down, you know, like when she says, like, I, I can't have a, ch- a hairy chest B that's fucked. You know, like that. That was like a good line de- delivery and was fun. But then there's also like trina stick my fist and i'm like i don't even know what that means like oh i think you know what my, it means <laughs> stick my fist up your ass i guess i don't know somewhere fucking else fisted i don't know it's just it's just like a, a dumb line i don't know or uh when she literally does the i know you are but what am i like later on in the movie like yeah i really like that <laughs> i was like me it's too so cute it's clever yeah but like you guys like like campiness and cheesiness yeah. and whatnot and i'm like allergic to it and you really once are once again i think if i watched this movie when i was 14 i probably would have liked it you know i would have been like dating an emo girl who probably would have had it as her personality as well yeah. but like watching it as an adult with absolutely zero nostalgia for it it's just like it's all so cringe and it's not at all like the way so we would speak <laughs> as emo kids it's it's, it's like true. literally it's literally like if you watched like a disaster movie or like epic movie and they put the emo character in it and it's like the one guy over there with the guy liner and black hair and he's just like <laughs> yeah i'm an emo kid and that's like literally bridget's performance in this movie for 75 percent of it yeah i can't you're right uh but mimi rogers in my opinion has the best lines um my I, favorite I don't know if I have any of hers yeah <laughs> really my no, favorite ahead, is when though. she's like walking into the bathroom and ginger's like shaving and she's like you don't have anything i haven't seen before and she's like you bet and mm. uh then she's like i'm fat all right get out and it's like it, it's so funny uh but also jesus christ on a bicycle I've stolen that and used it my whole life. Yeah, that's Listen, a good one. We, we just gotta we gotta live with the fact that we knew this wasn't gonna be elevated enough for Colton. So you're coming from when I just literally gave Leprechaun three a yay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very you know good we'll point. take what we can get. We'll take the crumbs, honey. The mom in this. So I I did like Mimi Rogers in it, but I was curious how you read it because I had always thought when any other time I'd watch this that the mom kind of knew what was going on. And yeah. like, yeah, I always had that feeling that I was like, cause you know, they make sure the dad's like totally clueless in this and just mm-hmm. this bystander. But I mean, there's so many things that the mom kind of comes across and she's just like, oh yeah. And like, I can't see this being a case of it, you know, like, oh yeah, that's, that's a normal amount of blood all over there. Like, oh, these aren't real fingers. Like. She does those so, l- lies for the the dad, I assume, but they never really like get into it, and they're always hiding it from the mom. They uh, cut that out of the movie, actually. Oh, they really? cut like twenty five minutes or something out of the movie, and I think this is in um, uh, maybe the director's cut or something. But when the mom finds the fing- the fingers, she like goes to the police station and she's like saying that she killed Trina and she's like trying to give the girls more time to like run away and like burn the fucking house down. I don't know what about Henry. He's just like dead weight. He's like the most <laughs> like cardboard character I've ever seen. Uh, but it's kind of funny. But like I, the funny thing is like one thing that I was saying was that every person in this to me seemed like real person that like I know from suburbia and that dad I was like I know so many dads like him especially when they have girls they're just like literally a body and it's like they do not care and ew all your girl shit is gross and they're just like why are you even married to this person and in this family (laughs) you know what I mean like He's always trying to, like, eat a meal, and they talk about, like, 
menstruation and stuff like that and he's just like we're trying to eat here but one thing i did like about the mom is that um going i have a lot of things about this being like you know a feminist movie or whatever uh but one of the things is that the mom sticks to her daughters the whole time she doesn't really give a shit about her husband she's like willing to you know run away and leave him behind yeah burn the house down and if he goes yeah exactly yeah yeah Yeah, so yeah yeah see and that's where i kind of like I guess it just never really gets into it because I kind of, you know, had thought even on this rewatch that I was like, okay, like, so maybe is like the, like the, all the females in this family, like, are they also werewolves? Like, is the mom, like, she went through this also? Because she seems to be like perfectly understanding of it. I don't think she knows about the werewolf part. I think she just thinks that they're like psychos. It's a yeah. metaphor for menstruation. It's literally just saying, like, I've went through this changing body and this, all this. That's all it is. I yeah. don't think there's a history of lycanthropes no. in the family. But... Well, actually, in the third movie. That's the <laughs> one that goes back to <laughs> They go time, back right? to, like, yeah, yeah colonial ain't watching the Canada. second movie. Alone the third um, movie. <laughs> and it starts with, like, the beginning of the lycanthrope curse. Just wait till Jill um, But anyway. <laughs> yeah, just well, wait until I go. Yeah, I guess you can force me if you want. <laughs> Listen, I just, I think, bro, God love you. I just think you were, you know, trying to read a little bit too hard into it. Was I reading too hard into it? I, I just, think, I think she, it was just like this wonderful, like, cause so much, heart. so much of this movie is like about like, kind of like ties and bonds, whether it be like family or whatever. But like, I, I just thought that that was a really good illustration of her just like commitment, you know just no questions asked like i'm taking responsibility for this i'm the matriarch we're mm-hmm. burning the fucking place down you know? yeah and i, I just, mean I, like i said that so works for me also i just i was like when she found like the body parts and stuff i'm like oh she seems like a little too cool with this so yeah. like maybe she has come ar- around this before because you know they they do bring up like kind of just off comments that this you know this werewolf or you know this of What's the place called? Like Bailey Downs. Bailey Downs. <laughs> yeah. But like, Life in Bailey so, Downs. so they make they make it seem like, you know, this is a, a local legend, like this whole werewolf thing. So I think that's where I was taking it from, where I was like, oh, maybe it has something to do with the family. And maybe oh, okay. I'm not wrong. You know, obviously I need to see two and three to dig more into this. So Sink your teeth into it. Two was actually quite good. <laughs> I saw two in theater. Into those bangers. <laughs> Oh, not that. Banger. <laughs> Banger. Bang- bangers. <laughs> to me, one of the unsung heroes of this was the school nurse. I thought the school nurse was awesome. She was like, I, I was trying to think. She kind of reminds me of uh, like the aunt from Sleepaway Camp. Oh, just God. like, just the way she portrayed it. It was just like super campy. And it was like, I was laughing the whole time. When she's just given the whole presentation on like menstruation mm-hmm. and stuff. I thought it was super funny. It was a really good moment. Yeah, I hope she has like more deleted scenes. I want her to like Me discover. Too. I want her to like discover something like a body or I don't know a dead. You mean animal. the uh, the nurse? Yeah, should have been. I just want her in, and I want her to like. I just need more. I need. I need a sequel, but like the whole movie from her perspective <laughs> in her life. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was going to ask, what do you guys think of the scene where Ginger gets bit by the werewolf? And was it edited like Liam Neeson climbing the fence and taken? Or did you guys enjoy it? I've never it's seen it. It's pretty taken. bad. But yeah. Well, it, it takes about 20 cuts for Liam Neeson to get over the fence. So I'm just I'm just curious if you guys thought it was good editing or not in that scene. No. I've always I've always enjoyed it, honestly, because I was like, I get that <laughs> there, you know, it, that it was low budget, but. I thought it was working with what it had and, you know, I didn't have a problem with it. I thought it was back in the day, you know, kind of like a little bit scary, maybe because there's so many cuts. Sometimes that works. Also, I felt like, you know, he did music videos and you could tell. And that's probably why, because he directed a lot of music videos. And that's kind of like... I I think they were expecting the werewolf to look a little better on camera with the light. I think it was what happened. (laughs) They were like, oh, for sure. Yeah. 20 cuts. Here we go. That was purely a like game of hide and seek i think <laughs> so you know you're not totally wrong but also i think it, it was just something i when i was watching it, i was like oh oof god this is uh this is a lot 
you guys should check out Liam Neeson climbing a fence and taken if you haven't seen it. So you got to see it. <laughs> I, I was going to say, like, I I actually went into this watching thinking the I thought the werewolf actually looked pretty good then compared to what I remembered. Like, just all the scenes, like, to me, for, like, an indie Canadian horror, I was like, yeah, I mean, like, it could have been worse. I do know that they, they push these guys to do CGI, so yeah. I know they opted not to do that and go fully practical and I I do know like John Foss was very adamant that he wanted this to be like a hairless werewolf. He didn't want it to look like any other werewolf that like was around. You I say that but I like, thought it worked. A, an American werewolf in London did practical effects 19 years before this far better with a similar budget. So and way more gore and way more in it like guy I, I don't know like it, this this isn't this isn't good practical effects like even for the time period or for the budget or for anything they're bad like they're just they're just bad I didn't and, mind and, and any other in any other movie you'd complain about them it's just because people are like beloved they love this movie they're awful and they they even i think know that they're awful in this movie it is a comedy so you know <laughs> yeah i mean i i just think i think it were me and maybe yeah because of the lens and also like almost everyone in this film like the the, the special effects guy, the score, the guy that did the score, the composer, like this was all of their first jobs. Like they had never done anything else. So I guess I also take that into consideration. That I'm like, yeah, because like I had notes too. Like I thought the score was pretty good in this. I guess like other first timers, like it reminded me of like 2000s, like horror video game or something. Just this weird mm -hmm. emo riff. You could tell he was, you know, playing with ideas like from other more famous scores and stuff and but just you know i i think it worked but yeah no i just i don't know i just wasn't overly offended i thought they showed just enough of it maybe at the end i thought maybe they showed a little too much of the werewolf that's where it got a little wonky for me there's a scene where the werewolf like jumps on something on the table yeah and, and yeah. like its legs are just like dangling when it jumps <laughs> and i'm like yeah okay like this that's not great, but I think when we just get the head and everything, I was like, yeah, this is, you know, uh, to me, this is fine. Like, it kind of gave me that, like, 80s feel, so I enjoyed it. I mean, that's kind of my... Yeah, it, it's just I compared it to An American Werewolf in London because they both are, like, horror werewolf movies that have a very comedic lens to it and one of them is you know heralded as some of the best creature effects of all time and then the other one's ginger snaps and they have comparable budgets so it's just you know it's yeah, like i'm glad I was... i'm glad it worked for you but like i i I think they're they're very bad, you know. They're very bad in the in the movie, and I, you know, they obviously edit around it, like you're in a Taken movie or whatnot. But they're, I don't know. You can. <laughs> I you was going to bring up the budget. Yeah. What about? So it? they had like yeah. five million, four point five million, mm -hmm. and they only got like less than six hundred thousand from the box yeah. office. So they like they fucking bombed. Big time. Yeah. Yeah. I know there's like a lot of issues too with the distribution for this because I know um. You know, uh, shout out to Leprechaun 3. Uh, Trimark <laughs> was originally the U.S. distributor, and then they uh, they fell out, which is such a unique... The whole story of it, I was laughing when I was reading it, because it's such, like, a unique thing, I think, to, like, Canada and our funding of the arts. Because basically what happens, they missed the time to submit to get funding from the government like the grants and they opted to wait another year in production so they could reapply but trimark was like no nah, we're not waiting like we're, we're dropping off of this because they didn't they, john fawcett talks about like just trimark didn't understand they were like what like you gotta wait for funding from the government like what what's going mm -hmm. on so something else happened there too um so they were gonna shoot it in uh toronto or they did but they were gonna cast in toronto but this is like around when columbine happened um so there was actually a lot of pushback on making this movie because people thought it was too violent for teenagers um so they actually so people in toronto like refused to like have anything to do with it so they had to go to vancouver actually to cast and that's where they found emily perkins and Catherine isabel yeah i was gonna say i saw i saw quite a bit about the there, there was a lot of backlash on it good uh good segue though speaking of speaking of backs uh <laughs> i was uh i was thinking while watching this that i was just uh you talked about colton like the scene 
I, I think you said your your favorite scene was uh, Ginger and Jason in the car, right? Yeah, my real favorite scene is what, you know, Jill and Mike picked. But yeah, my second favorite was definitely that. And I th- I thought the, the scene or the shot specifically of her spine kind of yeah. elongating and pushing up through the skin was a really nice touch. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, well, especially that scene and so much of it, I just thought about like the influence that this had on stuff like Jennifer's body, Trick or Treat. Like, there's a lot of things that I was like, look a lot like this film. Yeah, yeah. I would be curious, like, <laughs> now that I've mentioned American Werewolf in London, I'm just thinking about it. I'd be curious if, like, that similar shot was in that movie as well. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, this could definitely be bringing it back into, like, the, you know, pop culture knowledge, I guess. Because, I mean, it would be 20 years since that, right? Well, and especially, like, I guess, too, I was thinking more of them being more informed in terms of, like, not only uh, the werewolf stuff, but then just, like, the horror movies from, like, this feminist lens. and the- Yeah, the, the, yeah, the sexual awakening, the feminist lens, both of them, the trick-or-treat uh one and jennifer's body are very much of a similar cloth uh yeah i think ginger snaps walks so jennifer's body could run honestly you've got that female body horror like hell is a teenage girl um and going through such an experience like puberty and menstruation and the trials of being an adolescent in high school it's very terrifying in its own right and um i'm gonna talk about some girl shit for a second but uh for me Uh, What I really liked about this movie was that puberty and menstruation were pretty traumatic experiences. There's such um, an understated feeling of shame when you're navigating these experiences essentially as a child. Um, And I think Ginger Snaps really hones in on that feeling of embarrassment and trying to slow down the change or hide what's happening to your body. And it's just like the lycanthrope transformation because it's inevitable. You're eventually going to transform into something uh, unrecognizable in the end. And uh, in the beginning, Ginger is like really hesitant uh, about the transformation. She's horrified, but then she begins to relish that transformation when she notices the attention uh, it brings to her as a fully developed woman. And um, Mm -hmm. it also shows the predatory nature of men on women once they hit puberty. Uh, But one thing I really liked about this movie is that the men are not total pieces of shit for the most part. Um, It's actually Ginger who is the the real predator. Mm -hmm. Um, And she keeps trying to, like with the janitor, she keeps trying to say that he's this predatory guy on Bridget when he's not. He's just innocent and she kills him pretty brutally. Um, And our friend Willow uh, of the podcast, um, she wrote a really nice review on Letterboxd about trans transformation. And um, it was a really beautiful take. And one thing that I really took from that was like, um, she kept mentioning the shot with the razor clogged with hair. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought it was a really cool take on that. Like I never really thought about the trans transformation in this movie. Um, So that it's also really cool. Uh, What did you guys think about the difference in the male transformation and the female transformation? Because Ginger looks hot, right? She has that scene, the hot girl walk. Uh, And then you see Jason who looks like a cracked out like meth head. I know he's got like like, the sores and... (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Do you think that they're trying to say anything there about like, you know, the difference between puberty and men and women? Or do you think it's just a uh, coincidence? Or... Well, I was just hoping we'd get some scenes of Jason uh, laying in bed at night and waking up with uh, awkward boners and nocturnal emission, you know, just uh, <laughs> wet in the bed. You know, that, that would have been great. That would have really elevated this a little bit. Dear God. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But yeah. Uh, obviously he, he was just like almost like plagued by acne to like a crazy degree, which I guess, yeah. I don't know. There's, honestly, there's not too many monstrous aspects of men in puberty for the most part, other than just literally growing hair and wet dreams, I guess. But, mm-hmm. uh, I guess that's one thing that is easily kind of played up in a horror movie, kind of like the acne or you can kind of make it look really gnarly. Right. Right. Yeah. I thought it, I thought it was kind of funny because just, you know, like Colton said, like, no, you know, really when you're comparing it, like, you know, puberty in men is, is so much more kind of, you know, there we're not like pouring blood out of our bodies or anything monthly. So it, it, it's not as, you know, other than acne and stuff, you're not really seeing this stuff in, in a public eye, but it was kind of funny because they made Jason, like, Jason was almost freaking out just as much as Ginger, even though, 
you know, his transformation just really wasn't as big of a yeah. deal. But he was like making it so much you know, more big of a deal. I, I, I was curious, like, uh, you know, knowing at the school, noticing these guys just gr- <laughs> growing full fangs going on here. Just, yeah. Yeah, this is a normal thing in this town. Everyone's I guess. got their own problems, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was also Halloween. Yeah, that's, 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 yeah. <laughs> Uh, I like that answer. Just like, hey, man, everyone's got their own problems to worry about. Well, listen, I <laughs> one of my notes was like how this movie is like a portrait of narcissism. And I think it it very much applies to Ginger, but also almost everybody else in the movie. And like maybe society as a whole, especially suburban uh, milieu. I just... I I love that, you know, you've got your popular girl being very narcissistic, but also then when you have, like, Ginger, who is an outsider, they, like, literally, the drive to, like, be different is purely rooted in narcissism, and... Like, it like, kind of goes back to what you were saying in a way, Jill. I wrote, like, you know, your bo- your own body screws you. Like, it's like this train that <laughs> they can't get off, but she's, like, desperately trying to, like, jam the brakes on. And it's like, oh, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be different, you know, we're, I'll be the death-obsessed weirdo. I'm just going to play it up. And it's, you know, really just a complete sham in a way. She's just waiting. She, yeah, she's just, like, waiting for her moment to, like step into the spotlight mm-hmm. right I feel actually like... does ginger kill herself at the end does she impale herself on the knife or does bridget stab her i'm trying to remember well that was the question i was asking that you guys all made fun of me apparently it's very uh, clear exactly what happens i think at the she end of impales movie. herself i think it's oh, i see think i thought it was just kind of i thought it was kind of just in the jumble of them wrestling that it just kind of you know stabbed into her that was kind of what i took from it if you want to be charitable i guess you can just literally make the answer of like oh Oh, it doesn't really matter. She's gone anyways. But as a viewer, I just wanted to know, like, you know, right. <laughs> as a werewolf, did she want to die or did she want to keep living? Was it a curse or was she embracing your new form? You know, I was it think- Bridget overcoming and kind of putting her sister out of her misery or self-defense or what it was? I just, I, I didn't get it. What exactly happened there? I'm trying to remember, does this happen in this movie uh, where she kind of begs Bridget to kill her or is that the second movie? Something else. <laughs> No, she definitely doesn't uh, beg to be killed. No, in I think okay, kind okay, of never mind. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry, I'm thinking of something else. Spoiler alert for uh, Ginger Snaps 2 there. Jesus. Which, uh, that's the pick for next episode. Col- <laughs> Colton didn't want to tell you, but he picked Ginger Snaps Yeah, that's what I'm picking, actually. I would yeah, die. This whole yeah. episode is just a setup for the punchline of Ginger Snaps 2. It's just an appetizer. So I, I can't believe we've gone on this long and we haven't, no one's even brought up uh, the fun fact, Roan's fun facts. No cats killed in this movie. Oh Lot, lots of dogs. God. So many dogs, yeah. Lots of dogs. This is a this is a slaughter fest. Did you like that? R.I.P. to Baxter and Norman. And I don't know what the Norman. Rottweiler's name was, but, you know, he's probably dead too. Yeah. But not just dead. the dogs, but I will say, like, uh, you know, for I think another reason I really like this is it it would be so easy to cut this and turn it into like a 14 teen horror movie where I appreciate that it's like pretty gory, like yeah. from the from the get go. And it, it definitely revels in that uh, babies smearing dog blood on their face. Like, yeah, like <laughs> right the, the R rating. I just love it. You know, even if they they do say fuck a, a lot. A lot in this. Yeah, when they're playing ball hockey, just because you mentioned like the blood getting smeared on her face, like did nobody like take a look at the field or anything beforehand? There's just a fucking dog corpse on the <laughs> field. <laughs> like this is supposed to be school, right? Like you know, we used to wander around looking, pick at everything. If there was a dead squirrel, everyone would look at it. Oh, a dog. I was like, geez, how'd that happen? <laughs> a dead point. dog came out of nowhere. <laughs> The 90s were a different time. The 90s were a different time. I do want to say when you're hiding from a werewolf, we're really hiding from any kind of ghoul or goblin or anything. Uh, <laughs> How is that similar to a werewolf? <laughs> well, a werewolf, just anything. A ghoul or a goblin? Any, anything frightening in a horror movie. I'm, okay, always, right. I'm, I'm always curious why, you know, the first thing you do, you shut the flashlight off because you don't want them to see the light. 
But I feel like that doesn't matter if you're also like hyperventilating and you're just like super loud closet? and you're like, <gasps> and like, yeah, like you might as well just keep the flashlight on. Like we all know you're in the closet. So I just a, a horror movie trope that always gets me that I always just laugh about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You hide better. Be better. Be better. <laughs> be better. Be better. <laughs> That's what I was saying to this movie the entire time. Oh, oh, oh no! Wow. <laughs> Get out of here. So, so the only other real, like, kind of fun fact note I had written down was, I don't know if you had anything, Jill, about uh, about the three other people they offered uh, the role of Ginger to that uh, all were kind of somebodies, uh, maybe not as much back then. But uh, the roles originally, the original person they offered the role to was Scarlett Johansson. No fucking way. Uh, and Scarlett Johansson's uh, mother didn't want her to be in a horror movie. Uh, she didn't think at that age that she should be in a horror movie. So they said no. They also offered it to Sarah Pauly oh, and Queen. Natasha Leon. Oh, also, sweet. All my also faves. Offered, and they all... Uh, turned it down they said no i'm glad it was Catherine isabel because she's i I like the canadianness of the movie and uh she really helps preserve that her and emily perkins a lot of the actors and actresses in this were also in like goosebumps and are you afraid of the dark to go back to your i think it was goosebumps comment earlier yeah the uh, are you afraid of the dark to be specific are you afraid of the dark we're representing canada up here so exactly so, yeah, I like that. Yeah, well, even like, uh, what's his name? Peter uh, Peter Callaghan or whatever. The guy plays the teacher. Like, I mean, that guy's just like, there's so many just like random. To me, like, he's an iconic Canadian actor, but like, I don't know his name. I just know like, if there's a Canadian production, like, he's usually in it. Like, he's in a <laughs> lot of stuff. So it was just like, oh, yeah, that guy. Like, I know him. He's just like this canadian actor i think like the most mm-hmm. recent thing i've seen him in is he had like a pretty big role in uh working moms so uh, which i love that show but yeah i nice. uh i thought that was uh that was kind of interesting uh did you guys have any other notes on this i learned that i really dislike uh forehead prosthetics thanks to this movie <laughs> and vampire in brooklyn within watching them within the last couple of months they make people look just like aliens, not like vampires or werewolves. So I was waiting for you to bring it up because I know we. I do agree. I'm not. A, I'm not a fan. Time. I'm not a fan either. <laughs> and I like it. I like it. So it's not for everyone. So yeah, I guess uh, we can get into rating this then and land the plane. So if you're new to our podcast, our rating system is nay, okay, yay, or slay. Jill, we're gonna let you start off. Mm-hmm. This was your pick. What are you going to rate Ginger Snaps? And you can only rate it nay or okay. That's, you guys are so mean. (laughs) I'm tired of the slander that goes on here. Obviously, I'm going to give this a motherfucking slay, uh, you know, because this was like, this was like Bible to me growing up. um, And it still is. And, uh, you know, I love it. It's good. Uh, What about you, Rowan? Uh, Yeah, so I am, I'm going to give this a slay also. I, I'm a big fan of this, uh, I think the pros outweigh the cons, and I think the cons, you know, are are just kind of, you know, they make it cute to me. They make it, I like it. Quirky. That's the word I'm looking for. (laughs) Am I, am I big on people uh, using the English vernacular to come up with sayings like come buckety date bait? Maybe not. (laughs) But Why not? I, I mean, maybe. I don't know. I, I've never called anyone that. Uh, I'm sure I'd just get punched. Try it out mouth. tonight. Yeah, I, I feel like it'd be awkward. I'd have to call Exilia at her work. They would wonder why I'm doing this at her job. Yeah, but no, I, I just I think this is a great, iconic Canadian horror movie. Uh, you know, and kind of everything that I think that, you know, Colton, you said not having any nostalgia to it. Like it didn't work where. I think if you have nostalgia for the movie, there's just, like, a special place. So, I will say, like, I also understand people coming from the other end that wouldn't necessarily like this. So, I don't hold it against them. But I will give it a slay. Colton, 
what is your rating? Yeah, I I mean, obviously, I know everybody loves this movie, but uh, I definitely don't. I think the performance by uh, Bridget's actress, Emily Perkins, is bad. I think uh, the werewolf, whatever (laughs) it is, the effects are (laughs) not the greatest. I do like kind of like how they contort her eyes a little bit or like the hair kind of sprouting from her shoulder from the claw and stuff. Like I do like some of the effects. It's just as a full blown werewolf, it's uh, it's not very good looking in my opinion. I also think for me personally, as an emo kid growing up, I thought so much of the dialogue and the portrayal of that edginess was completely cringy. It was like so edgy and trying to be so cool that it just was inauthentic. It felt like a boomer trying to write it to me. And I know she obviously wasn't that old, but it just, it felt off. Like it wasn't authentic to my experience. Like maybe there are people that have had this experience, uh, but it just, all the dialogue to be felt off. Yeah. So I also just, we never really mentioned it, but I lost interest in this about an hour into it. Like I saw there was 45 minutes left and I was like, oof, you know, I felt... (sighs) I was like, God, it's going to be hard. So, yeah, I um, I enjoyed it a lot more my first watch when I didn't know anything about it. And I kind of saw what people saw in it. I was like, OK, yeah, this is a this is a good metaphor for menstruation, even if it's delivered like a sledgehammer, which is fine. You know, it can be. And it's a good feminist horror movie. But I think this time around, I just really didn't enjoy it. So I'm going to give it an OK uh what about you, Mike? Um, okay, well, I totally understand a lot of your uh, issues with it, for sure. Yeah, you don't have to agree with them. I know you don't. It's, I, you know, no, 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 no. I, but I, like, I do get where you're coming from. And, I mean, kind of like Ro said, too, uh, it is quite possible that part of my love for this movie is nostalgia. Like, I can't divorce it from my, like... Young yeah, it's like what I days. said with, yeah. with Jurassic Park. I was like, it's part of me is not getting. Yeah, it. exactly. Yeah. And um, so I do. I honestly, I'm giving it a slay. Uh, because I do still enjoy it. When I watched it, it's so funny because you were like, "Oh my god, there's 45 minutes left." And one of my notes was like, "I feel like that even though this is almost two hours, it felt like it was 90 minutes because I thought it was well paced." So, you know, mm-hmm. I I don't know. Maybe it's just because I've seen it so many times and like I know the beats. Uh, but I just thought that I don't care if a lot of the metaphors and the issues that they address in this are delivered with a sledgehammer. Sometimes I like a sledgehammer. Peter Gabriel. Yeah, that's what I said. Sometimes that is the right tool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I just loved that there was, there was a lot going on in this movie. Like it works on a lot of different levels. Um, like I think has a sledgehammer king. I listen. I don't judge you. No you don't judge me. Here. You don't judge me. Yeah. Um. But I also, and you know, I thought you know, it's obviously like humorous and campy, but I also just really love the tragedy of it, and I've always thoroughly enjoyed that. You know, they pull themselves away and isolate themselves on purpose, and then Ginger decides, like, oh look, I can actually use my blossoming difference as like a way to ingratiate myself in this society that we you know distance ourselves from and to me i just think that that is so tragic for bridget and that's why i've really like kind of sympathized with her character because she maybe wasn't putting on an act like ginger's like whole thing you know i think was was kind of putting she was a bit of a poser let's like go back and use that like teenage lingo right she was more of a poser she essentially was just like biding her time until she could probably leave her in the dust anyway and just the whole like first part of the movie i was like uh oh. it just breaks my heart and then at the end you know when she's dead and she's in their room and like I said that shot and everything i just think that there is like a deep vein of tragedy in it that is coupled with the comedy and stuff and i just thought that was really effective i like a tragic comedy obviously my screen name has tragedy in it so on everything <laughs> so yeah i just i give it a slay i think it's still really effective um, on so many levels and I enjoy it in spite of some of the flaws. So yeah, slay. Slay all the way, all day. All right. Well, so on that note, uh, we told you what we thought about the film and we asked what did you think about it? And you know, Rowan, not on his job, didn't post uh for your opinions till mere hours ago. But we still got quite a few responses in, and I'll make a promise, if anyone gets the responses in late, I'll read them, like, next episode or something. We'll set a little time off. Uh, But on Twitter, uh, Jiggy's Horror Corner wrote and said, Definite Slay. Catherine Isabel and Emily Perkins work so well together, and their sibling relationship feels genuine to me, making it all the more tragic. 
quality story, and I'm on one of my personal favorite werewolf movies. So yeah, another slay. Uh, although I would I would respond back that it's probably not hard to be one of the better werewolf movies because there's really not that many great werewolf movies. I don't know why, just people. To me, people just can't do it right. But uh, then we will go uh, to Instagram. We had a couple responses on Instagram. So uh, Frank and Vegan wrote and simply just said, love it. A podcast on Elm Street uh, wrote absolute Canadian gem. Mm, yeah. uh, underscore JPL 260 wrote 10 out of 10. Damn. Uh, Glizzy McGuire 42069 <laughs> wrote and wrote iconic. Love all three of these movies the most. So slay and we heart Catherine Isabel. Mm, yes, she is an icon. I like that you said 42069 instead of 42069. Yeah. <laughs> after <laughs> after I said after I said it, I was like, oh wait a second. Also, yeah. Glizzy McGuire. That's a, that name is brilliant. Name. Yeah, I'm I am obsessed. And then last but not least, nothing to fear podcast wrote and said, this one is a delight. Pamela forever. Mm, yes. Yes. Go Pam. We need a lot of Be my Pamela mommy. representation. Ooh, mommy play. Okay. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Cut that out. Cut that out. Never. I'm not cutting it out. So from that, uh, you know, I think we're going to go over the horrific hotline. We, we have our tried and true faithful over there so uh let's see what nicholas has to say so ginger snaps what a great choice for a movie to discuss uh i really enjoyed the movie i think it's a let's say a great combination of a werewolf horror and something like carrie for example and it just mixes the daily life of a teenager with the not so normal life of a uh, werewolf to be so to say and i think there's some some interesting ideas and interesting concepts in which it kind of relates the um the becoming a werewolf to puberty and growing up becoming an adult um and of course uh referring back to sexuality which is often part of the werewolf mythos so a really enjoyable movie with two great main actresses and uh, my MVP of the movie is the mother of the two sisters <laughs> who really goes up and beyond to protect her two daughters without even knowing what's going on. So um, it's actually a sleigh for me. Didn't oh. think it would oh. be um, before rewatching it, but I have to say it is a sleigh and I really... Look forward to rewatching the other two movies uh, soon because They're I do coming. have fond memories at least for <laughs> the second one. That's oh. awesome. Thanks, Nicholas. I have like tears of happiness right now. I'm so excited. <laughs> I think I'm that's like a, life. I think that's like unanimous slays from every single person that wrote in. So it sounds like I have a lot of hate coming my way. <laughs> no, we don't hate you. You're allowed to have your opinions. No, 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 it's cool. not, it's not, not from not from you tea. guys. The, the listeners. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, you're fine. Yeah, if you want to leave a voicemail like Nicholas does on the horrific hotline. You can call in, but I don't know. Maybe we should just like literally get rid of that accent, you know, that that part of it. You can do so at 1902-418-8620. Or you can just message us uh, on Instagram or any of our other socials. Or if you want to send it to us directly in email, you can do so at itslayspodcast at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, if you made it this far on the show, uh, if you want to yell at me for my okay rating, you can do so on our social media at itslayspodcast. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Slasher, Letterboxd. If there's a social media, we're probably there at itslayspodcast. And if you want to support the show like our horror hounds, Holly, Nicholas, Patrick, Mark, Stephen, Joy, and Carvey, Gain access to the Patreon-exclusive show Stream Screams, hosted by Jill, and get episodes of this here main show 48 hours early. Be sure to head on over to patreon.com slash Podcast and choose whatever tier works best for you. Now, Rowan, go ahead and plug the playlist. Well, if you're into spooky music, you can go over to Spotify and check out the It Slays Podcast horrific playlist if you have any problems finding it. You can also go to the link tree, the link in any of our social media Click on it, it'll take you right there. 
We put music from movies we review or iconic horror movies or just horror movies we love. Put all on a playlist. Get some banners for you to listen to. We might have to add something from this because I actually kind of did like the score from this. We didn't really touch on it much, but uh, I thought the score was pretty, pretty strong with this. Gave me some vibe. So we'll see. Maybe. There's Cradle of Filth. Yeah, there is Cradle of Filth on the soundtrack. Some Hate Breed, stuff like that. So uh, you never know. We'll... We'll have to get something good on there. But yeah, go get your spooky music on. And I think all that is left is for us to announce our upcoming episode. And it is Colton's pick, so we'll shoot it over there for him to let you know about watching Ginger Snaps (laughs) 2. Yeah, so next time we'll be doing Ginger Snaps 2, of course. Uh, But uh, no, I mean, this is actually kind of weird because my mom wound up watching this movie kind of unprompted on Shudder because my stepdad got rid of Netflix like most of us here in Canada and picked up Shudder instead. So they wound up watching The Lodge from 2019 and she asked me my opinion on it. And I was like, well, I'll save aspects of my opinion. But I was like, I don't remember it all that well. I should probably rewatch it. And then when I did the random roulette earlier today, it came up as the number one choice. So screw it. We're doing The Lodge. It's time for some elevated horror from 2019 after, you know, Leprechaun and Ginger Snaps and a couple of fun choices. Let's uh, be miserable for a change. Hell yeah. I'm actually excited for this. I I bought this the day it came out and I've never watched it because I had only heard bad things and then I just was like, oh, I'll watch it someday. Yeah, I mean, since we've been getting snowed in like crazy here in Newfoundland, I don't know about where you are, Rowan. It's, uh, I don't know, it's kind of fitting for this movie, kind of, you know, <laughs> stuck in the snow. So yeah, get your uh, eyeballs in on the lodge and we will be back in two weeks. Uh, and we'll probably be back. I think we got another now slain in the in the works for later on this week and yeah it might be out by the time they're listening to this yeah actually. by the time it should yeah, be we'll out see. and yeah. also i think the newest uh stream screams will also be out on patreon there so if you want to watch chupa you better go watch it now don't uh, do it <laughs> but yeah i think that's everything for today as always thank you for the support I am your humble host, and this is my real voice, Rowan. <laughs> Bye, it's Mike. <laughs> I'm Colton. It's Jill. See you later. We're going to expand our weekly video segment to take you into the back shelves of your local video store, back where it says horror videos, and where kids are devouring some awful films that we call the video nasties. Are you freebasing? Inquiring minds want to know. I have to break free from this culture of mechanical reproductions and the thick encrustations dying on the surface. Not the prime time yet. Mom, the new flesh. The pain, I can assure you, will be exquisite. As for our deaths, come with me and be immortal. We have such sights to show you. I've got to return some video tape. Thank you.